You're listening to the N2K Space Network. Hi, I'm Brandon Karpf, Executive Director of N2K Space. I want to share with you a word from our sponsor, the Italian Trade Agency. If you didn't know, Italy plays a critical role in the international space economy as one of the largest and most advanced aerospace manufacturing hubs. From satellite systems that connect the world to interplanetary missions that push the boundaries of exploration, Italy stands at the forefront of space advancement. JUICE, Euclid, Artemis, DART, and Webb, Italy's space industry had a significant part in each of these missions. Italy is now launching a new business acceleration program in the United States, completely dedicated to aerospace with six groundbreaking new startups right in Houston. Tune in as ITA unveils the unparalleled innovation and excellence that brought Italy to be a top U.S. aerospace supplier. Visit itahouston.com slash spaceitup23 to learn more. You can also visit space.n2k.com slash ITA for a whole bunch of new information. And a sincere thanks to our friends at ITA for sponsoring this podcast. Welcome to T-Minus Deep Space from N2K Networks. I'm Alice Carruth, producer of the T-Minus Space Daily Podcast. Deep Space includes extended interviews and bonus content for a deeper look into some of the topics we cover on our daily program. Our guest today is Ravimbo Samanga. Ravimbo is an Africa-based policy analyst currently working for Access Partnership and sits on the board of the Space Arbitration Association. She serves as an ambassador for the Milo Space Science Institute and previously served a two-year term as the national point of contact for Zimbabwe in the Space Generation Advisory Council, which is in support of the United Nations program on space applications. Who better to share insight into the growing space industry across Africa? My name is Ruben Bostamanga. I am a space policy analyst. I am also an ambassador at the Milo Space Science Institute. And I sit uh, on a number of boards, including the Space Arbitration Association, as well as the Executive Advisory Committee for the Charles F. Bolden Group. I say space policy analyst by day, but I'm also a space advocate by night and day as well. I'm very passionate just about outreach and sharing my knowledge and my journey with everyone else, especially in the African context, to inspire, to uh, inform, and I think to allow for a changing of the narrative in a way that suits our local heritage. I'm based in uh, Bulawayo, Zimbabwe. It is the second largest city, and we are in the southern tip of Africa, just next to South Africa, Zambia, Namibia, Botswana, and we make up a nice community of I would say highly resilient, um, highly informed and determined people with close ties to our cultural heritage. So I'm going to prefix it. Uh, We're never going to cover the entire continent in this conversation. Africa is a massive continent and has been involved in space for some time. We've obviously got very established space agencies like the ones up in Egypt. And then we've got others that are kind of starting to come on this journey of space Can you tell me a little bit about some of the countries that are working on space policy right now and where we should be watching? I would say there's a lot of activity happening on the continent. Perhaps adopting a hierarchical view would be the best start, which is to start from the top and see the organization of the institutions and how their mandate sort of flows into national agendas. So the national institutions so far that has coordinated the African Outer Space Program would be the African Union Commission. And under this African Union Commission, we will also soon have the development of the African Space Agency, which is intended to coordinate the activities of all African states, all 55 of them. So it's a very big mandate, but so far I think there has been good headway in securing the financial and administrative requirements towards its operation, and it currently has four directorates. hope I get it correct, but they currently deal with, of course, policy, which is an important one, space, applications, 
space operations and technology. And I believe the last might be, well, I've forgotten the last, but in any case, the documents are freely available. I'll touch on what I do know, which is the policy, and that is the African Space Policy and Strategy, which were released by the African Union Commission, hoping to make use of different uh, applications, especially Earth Observation, which is our largest market segment in Africa. So to that end, we have seen a number of countries engage in not only research and development, but also technology and innovation in a number of sectors, as observation included, but also in sort of the upstream capabilities as well, which is the ability to manufacture and produce our own components and, and products. So it's quite exciting to see. Uh, with regards to policy, quite recently, Ghana was the latest country, I believe the 10th, to enact its space policy. And essentially what it is, is a framework to guide different institutions on how they can manage their program. And each country will have its own needs and will align its policy with that need. So we see with countries like Egypt that just signed international partnerships for development of manufacturing, assembly, integration, and testing facilities. That is the building of local capabilities. And then we see with countries like Kenya, which is about to enact a private sector bill, that they're looking towards uh, business development and the enabling of a very active startup hub. So I could touch on many of them. They're Morocco. Zimbabwe, of course, launched a satellite recently. Rwanda has been paving an impressive path as well, and uh, a number of others that I think will have a lot of ambitions in the coming years. So you covered quite a lot in just that one introduction. Obviously, a lot of the nations that have been involved in space for quite some time started off with government-led initiatives. But there's also a growing commercial space industry across the whole continent of Africa as well. Can you talk a little bit about some of the companies that have started to build over there? Certainly. I would say that as of 2023, there are at least 283 or more new space companies, as we refer to them, operating in Africa. Majority of them, of course, operating in the downstream, which would be the use or derivatives of data analytics or information uh, derived from space and application systems, again, in the Earth observation market. But we also see some up-and-coming players in the components manufacturing market. I'll touch on a few which come to mind quite easily. New Space Systems, located in Cape Town, has been manufacturing, assembling, and I perceive integrating and testing satellites for the last couple of years as well on behalf of South Africa. We also see that there are companies that are utilizing new methodologies for existing challenges or providing new solutions. I will touch on Hypernova Space again uh, from South Africa that is developing interesting propulsion mechanisms for future space transportation. So that's quite interesting as well. And even more, just away from the commercial front, we have a lot of stakeholders that are developing new outreach methods, new ways of preparing us for future space exploration. And I'll touch on, again, a good friend, Dr. Adriana Marie, who is the head of Proudly Human, and they are conducting off-world experiments in different sites like Antarctica and uh, the Maghreb Desert. And these are all indicative of a need to prepare our collective consciousness towards a future settlement in space. I think these are all quite innovative. Away from that, we can also touch on the huge agri-tech industry. I think there are about 40 precision farming companies, majority of them, especially in Eastern Africa and West Africa as well, which highlights not only a need for food security solutions in Africa, but I think a desire to create challenges that speak to, again, our local heritage, which is an agricultural region, agricultural continent. And last but not least, what could I touch on? There are industrial and international industrial partnerships which are looking at utilizing small satellites for diverse purposes, especially related to climate change, to wildlife and conservation, to water resource management as well. I cannot name the full depth and breadth of them all, but I think it all just speaks to our desire to not only be I think uptakers of this different data and products, but also contributors as well. And I do see a research and development um, base forming in Africa. One interesting fact though is the majority of the founders and CEOs of these startups are below the age of 35. So it's a youth revolution as well. We see a very young population of entrepreneurs coming up. And 
I think that's quite interesting to know them to look forward to, given that half of our population is below the age of 19. That's really exciting that you've got such a growth in such a young area as well in Africa. And you touched a little bit on ground-based infrastructure. Obviously, infrastructure is such a big hot topic over here in the US and across Europe as well for ground stations, but also for spaceports. What's going on across the continent right now with, with that infrastructure development? I believe a lot is happening behind the scenes. I do believe there's one publicly profiled project, which is the Djibouti spaceport. And an interesting fact about spaceports is they, of course, have the geographical advantage of being located around the equator or having most efficiency when located near the equator. And I believe there are about 13 equatorial countries. And if I'm not mistaken, at least nine of them are located in Africa. And that's quite an impressive geo location advantage that I think will be made great use of, I think has already been made great use of by the Kenyan spaceport, which is not operational at the moment, but provides a lot of prospect. And of course, along the other countries, such as Somalia, I believe, has plans to pursue a spaceport application. So to that end, I would say there's a lot of investment for critical infrastructure in space, and it certainly will go towards such initiatives. I cannot remember the figures, but I do know that if all the opportunities for spaceports were fully utilized in Africa, it will double launch capabilities as they currently stand. So I really throw it out there to the powers that may be that this is an opportunity we should be making great use of. And perhaps private sector can help us do so because they bring the innovation and the experience. And again, international collaborations can help us learn from the successes and perhaps pitfalls of the past. I'm excited to hear that there is more development going on across the continent. And I'm excited to hear a lot more about the African Space Agency and how you're working together as a continent. Obviously, we've seen this model happen across Europe before, and it's been a huge success. What is Africa doing as a collective to figure out things like policy for launch, safety standards, you know, that kind of thing? I think um, it's important to frame Africa's development according to three different nodes. So I think that uh, there are three primary nodes, but I'd like to add one, which um, maybe is not commonly agreed on, but I think is quite is just as important. But I'll start with the primary three, which is research and development being the first, technology being the second, and innovation being the third. And the one that I'll put before all of these would be the awareness raising node. And why I say awareness raising is important is we need to have the requisite political will to continue space programs, especially in Africa. We have to have these space ambitions contend with other existing SDG challenges. And to that end, we have not only experienced a slow progress up the development ladder because of this duality, but I think it makes it even harder to continue to move up the ladder and justify technology and innovation in the face of those challenges. So that said, we are very much on the research and development node, and we cannot really speak to a lot of the innovations that our global peers are at. But nevertheless, I think it's important that we show our capabilities to the rest of the entire community that we have a cultural heritage that allows us to speak into research and development and industrial partnerships and maintain a voice. So that said, I would say that the vast amount of our conglomeration or consolidation of the African market has focused on research and development partnerships and a little bit of technology as well. Some of the partnerships I can talk of from the top of my head include the Global Monitoring for Environment and Security Partnership or GMES in Africa, which is a partnership between the AU and the EU for Earth Observation. And what I find symbolic about this partnership is not only are we learning from a similar model, but I think it also demonstrates our capacity to utilize space products and services in a way that's already been done or is being done by global partners. And essentially, it started off as a 13 million euro funded project which was given to 12 different consortia of research institutes all over Africa. And they meet regularly for an important process of information sharing, knowledge sharing, best practice sharing, to 
towards the betterment of the earth observation industry. We also have some regional initiatives which are in progress. For example, the Southern African Development Community Satellite Data Sharing Cube, or the SADC Data Sharing Cube, which was an initiative of the 19 SADC countries, starting, of course, with four primary countries, to have a better access to regional structures for satellite Earth observation and sharing that data freely and openly. We also have, I believe it's called the ARM project, the Africa Resource Management Project, which is, again, four countries that have come together to contribute one satellite each and share the data across those satellites. I think the sharing of resources, skills, and the free movement of whether it's persons or the free movement of money, et cetera, or products and services, rather. And this falls under the great umbrella of the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement, which is a seminal document in terms of trade, I think, since the World Trade Organization. And it brings together a combined African GDP of $3 trillion U.S. dollars. And when fully effected, this should give us the opportunity to have the free movement of products and services, but also make best use of the youth, the women-led enterprise, which stands at about 60%. And I think just the general capabilities and capacities of all members of African society. That said, while very nascent, I think there's very good prospect, there's good ground. Um, and I say this is an important aspect to demonstrate to the international community, which is our proactive policy making. Because I understand public policy and space to largely have been reactive. It's good to demonstrate what a publicly oriented program can look like from the start and to have that groundwork laid. So certainly more to come, but for now, we await on the full coming into operation of the African Space Agency, which I'm sure will have a lot to offer the African population. We'll be back. This episode is brought to you by KPMG. At KPMG, innovation is the go-to state of mind. Their visionary thinkers and advanced technology help you see beyond the now, uncover new insights, and turn them into opportunities. KPMG can help you leverage the value of data and drive transformational outcomes through innovation. To explore their thinking, go to kpmg.us. Where are you seeing investment right now? Where is it coming from? Is it government-led? Is it private industry-led? I'm certainly seeing, for the most part, investment from governments and other state institutions. So, for instance, at the institution-to-institution level, I'm seeing a lot of partnerships coming together. For instance, Azure Cosmos, the Azure Space Agency, recently signed a partnership with the Egyptian Space Agency, I think, to enhance satellite programs and services. And furthermore, we see also international industry partners having full claim and uh, lots of success in introducing products and services within the African market. So there is a lot of market access initiatives and market access funding. For instance, UtilSat, which is a digital connectivity partner, has had massive success in revenues from year to year, especially in Africa, and that is a demonstration of not only needs, but I think the ability for international partners to have a stake, so significant investment there. If I understand, and I don't have the name at the top of my head, but there is a program that has partnered with local institutions to increase the uptake of Copernicus data in Africa. So there is funding towards not only uptake of data, but I think the training and services involved and STEM education as well between Intelsat and MaxiQ have partnered to increase STEM education in Africa as a workforce development need. So understanding, again, going back to those four nodes of development, that there needs to be some awareness raising, and that is most often done by empowering people through knowledge and resources, ETC. So to that end, I will say majority of investments, again, institution or state level, um, and I think this follows in line with the mandate of international treaty laws, which is to provide states with the authority to coordinate these activities. 
And through the states, we see there is an enabling of private sector as it should necessarily flow. And through, again, the funding received from private sector, we're seeing the offshoot of grassroots initiatives accordingly. So you talked about how important academia is, and obviously we know that academia plays such a pivotal role in space research. What are African universities doing to develop their programs to be able to create that workforce to support the upcoming industry? We have a network of about five universities that are coming together to offer space-related programs and institutions. And I believe there are at least two universities that provide space law and policy professional qualifications. We also have an influx, I think, of grassroots initiatives, institutional initiatives at the national level. But of one of significance that I'd like to mention, a good friend of mine, Mr. Etim Ofiong, who has had an instrumental role not only in the drafting of the AU policy and strategy, but is a proponent of the building of local capabilities. He is one of the coordinators of the African Space Leadership Institute, which is a foundation that's setting itself up as a think tank or a policy arm to the African Union Outer Space Program. And what I do appreciate is the program that they have started on space law and policy to equip everyone with the knowledge they need to become policy experts in this field. I'm very pleased in the next few weeks, I'll be giving a guest lecture myself on lunar development policy with an African twist. And I say an African twist because I give a case study on the Africa mining governance framework and how we can use that for lessons and progress for future resource utilization on the moon. So these kinds of initiatives, they bring the opportunities and benefits of space much closer and they allow for everyone to have that workforce development in order to be competent in these future roles that we are creating, will hopefully create. I wanted to go back a little bit to the conversation you were having earlier about the importance of earth observation and space agriculture. What kind of effect does earth observation have on the agricultural industry throughout Africa? I think that earth observation has a huge developmental impact. I believe that for countries like Zimbabwe that are affected by the El Nino drought season and climate change and being in a semi-arid region, it's important to have that capacity building mechanism that informs a number of different challenges. So for instance, I'll start with government mandates. Zimbabwe also had an ambition to conduct space programs in order to address the climate change issues and agri-tech or agri-tech solutions are being found to be a policy innovation that can support government mandate. At the same time, we're also hearing calls of wanting to integrate ourselves into the future knowledge or digital economy. And to this extent, that tech or technology and knowledge transfer will help us not only usher in that kind of workforce or skills training, but also help us integrate into a future digital economy through its off products. And what I mean by this is in order to engage in agri-tech, it needs some form of digital infrastructure or connectivity. So it sort of addresses two or more challenges at once. And it's a very, um, I think, all-encompassing solution to a number of challenges, which perhaps if I can add a final point is to say, often it's thought of that we can't have space and address our challenges at the same time when actually space is the way that we address our challenges. And it's such a multidisciplinary space that it flows into not only, I think, the more common SDG uses, like for managing our resources, whether that's water, land, et cetera, climate change, but also managing of people and securing of assets. And we're seeing a diversification, at least in the globe, for more innovative uses of earth observation in asset monitoring or even in the monitoring of movement of peoples for humanitarian uh, causes. So to that end, I see a lot of hope for really rationalizing how we use space and ensuring that we have the requisite tools to integrate all of these different solutions in a fair and sustainable way. Vimbo, I feel like we've covered so much and I've just even just slightly scratched the surface. Is there anything else you wanted to cover in this conversation that you want our listeners to kind of learn about the policies in Africa? I think the last thing I'd want to say is that Africa certainly has a lot to say when it comes to space. We do understand that 
we are an emerging region and that there is lots yet still to cover. But we are at such a pivotal moment of our global conversation that to make it truly meaningful needs every single diverse voice to speak into it. And I really hope that Africa will have its platform not only to share its story, but to have its story included in the greater narrative of what's currently happening. So happy to continue the conversation and hoping to support more advocates as we continue to go. But the more we share our stories, the more we can learn from each other. And being an African myself, I know that the oral sharing of our histories is really the bedrock of our society. And this is a wonderful way to share it. So thank you so much, Alice. And I hope that it will reverberate for years to come. That's it for T-minus Deep Space for September the 2nd, 2023. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. This episode was mixed by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Carr. Our Chief Intelligence Officer is Eric Tillman, and I'm Alice Carew. Thanks for listening.